Hello, I'm Ron Clark. Today, I'm going to talk about light <laughs> and color, actually. Um, uh, a viewer asked that I talk about the light introduced in step six in making an elemental and um, it's again in step seven in the making of elementaries and in the work with uh, the subtle senses. So, <clears throat> light as a substance, a magical substance that we work with, is first introduced in step six in this section on making an elemental. Now, <clears throat> an elemental is, it's called elemental because it's so simple. Uh, as an elemental, my dear Watson, you know, referring to something that's simple as opposed to something composed of the elements. That comes in step seven, and Barden calls them elementaries, okay? So, it's easy to confuse the two terms, but elementals, just remember elemental, my dear Watson, and you'll, you'll keep it straight. Um, an elemental is composed, basically, of light. Now, it should be very easy for you by step six to imagine, as Barden suggests, a universal storehouse of light, uh, uh, an aspect of the universe that is composed just of light, just as we do with the elements. We imagine an aspect of the universe composed of just the fire, and we accumulate the fire from that place, basically. So that's what we're doing with the light. Now, <clears throat> the light that Barden's referring to here would ordinarily just call a white light. It has no real color. It is the color of sunlight, which is what we call natural white light. Okay? <clears throat> So that's what we're going for when we think of light. It has no real color, uh, so we call it white. Um, and we are accumulating that light into a sphere shape, say. You know, just as we've done, learned to do with the vital energy and the elements. It's, at this point, no big deal, okay? But... <clears throat> In doing that, to really understand how that is working uh, in terms of making an elemental and, you know, later an elementary, we have to understand what light is, okay? <clears throat> now, light is a function of our perception, we perceive this very narrow range of frequencies of energy as light, as color. We can't really separate color from light. Color is born out of light. Um, <clears throat> so, any rate, light is... Uh, a flowing wave of energy, and that wave has frequency, and its certain frequencies of vibration, our sensory apparatus perceives that as light, as visible light. So, <clears throat> that's our experience of light. It's all perceptual, <clears throat> but when we imagine light, it's a bit different. It's not waves of energy, okay? Uh, <clears throat> in the same way. Uh, what... When we create something in our imagination, we're drawing it from our memory. All imagination is rooted in the memory. 
we draw bits from our memory of things we have experienced in the past, of light as we've experienced it in our lives. Okay, so we have this imaginary light. Now, <clears throat> we know from our experience with the vital energy, with the elements, that when we use our imagi creative imagination to form an image of something, a sensory uh, image of something, we connect with the objective reality of what we're imagining. Because fundamentally, there's nothing we can't imagine there's nothing that we can imagine that does not exist somewhere in the infinite universe. And when we're imagining something like the light, it exists pretty much everywhere in the universe. So we've got this big reality, this plane of reality that is light. Just as there's this plane of reality that is the fire element. Okay. So, when we imagine the light, we're connecting with that plane of reality that is light. And what is that? That is a central meaning. Okay, it is the essential meaning of light. The Catholic brilliance, which is like the, the supreme manifestation of light contains essential meaning. Essential meaning is born out of that brilliance. So it's, what I'm saying is that relationship, especially between light and essential meaning, is very close. Okay, so the essential meaning is what we are connecting with Whenever we make this kind of connection through the mental realm, through the like attracts like, law of the mental realm, we put out this image, it, it attracts us to, and uh, the image, the objective reality is attracted to it, etc. We make that connection with the essential meaning of light, just like we make the connection with the essential meaning of fire. Okay? So the light that we imagine is more <clears throat> about essential meaning than the light that we see with our eyes. That also is about essential meaning, but for us it's about our perception <clears throat> as opposed to just the essential meaning itself. Because we don't look for essential meaning. Okay? Um, but when you do look at the essential meaning of light, of any light that you perceive, you understand. You understand its meaning. Um, and we'll get to that in a minute. So, what we are using in the creation of an elemental, that you know, handful of light or ball of light, that we're impregnating with our desire <clears throat> and we're creating a mental life form basically in creating an elemental <clears throat> uh, we're creating it out of the essential meaning the essential meaning of a mental body the essential meaning of our intention this is all the essential meaning that manifests itself on the mental plane, on the mental realm. That's really the only uh, place that an elemental is effective, is on the mental realm, mental plane. It can affect the astral, but it's got to be a very strong um, uh, uh, elemental to do that, or, you know, designed specifically with the intention that it will have an effect on the astral plane. So, <clears throat> it is a very simple process of just gathering up 
that light from that universal storehouse. Now, you can make an elemental out of any color of light. doesn't have to be just that white brilliance, that white light, <clears throat> that you make an elemental out of. Which brings me to the issue of color and light. Color, all perception of color is rooted in light. What we see, we see uh, the color of a, a, a thing, okay? This is turquoise. But what we are seeing is that white light bouncing off the fabric of this packet and all that's being absorbed here is the red spectrum. So it's the turquoise, the, uh, the cyan that bounces off and we see it with our eyes. That is color. You know, here it's absorbing the cyan and all we're seeing is the red. Okay? <clears throat> it requires light. In the absence of light there is no color because it's, again, that vibrating energy form, okay? <clears throat> so, <clears throat> when we imagine a color, it is, again, based on our memory of light. What we are imagining is not light, not composed of light at all. It is composed of memory substance, okay? When we imagine it. But again, if we make that connection, you know, imagining it combined with our will, we connect with all the red in the universe. You know, it exists just like all the fire in the universe exists on a particular plane that we can uh, um, experience. So does all the red in the universe exist on a specific plane that we can experience, okay? And we can gather that and make an elemental out of red light instead. Or blue light or green light, or yellow light, or purple light, or any light that we want. Um, <clears throat> which sort of brings up the work with uh, uh, colored light. And I'm calling it light <clears throat> because that's its origin. You know, and that's the origin of our experience of color is light. And so all these colors that we work with, all color, is the child of light, essentially. Okay? <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so, working with colored lights <clears throat> is something I suggest that you do. It's not covered in initiation in hermetics. Um, you, you will need it if you want to go forward with either practice of magical evocation, which uses colored lights to a certain extent, or the, the uh, key to the true Kabbalah which, you know, light is a, a, a large factor <clears throat> in uh, uh, building, you know, each letter within yourself, etc. Um, <clears throat> so, how to work with light? The best thing that I would say, well, I'd suggest two things. One, uh, look at things in your day. Look at different colors um, and <clears throat> detach and see how that color makes you feel. What feelings does it generate? It might be very subtle or it might be very strong, depending on <clears throat> what color it is and how you relate to it. See, color, our understanding of what color means is rooted um, culturally. Okay? Um, 
yellow means one thing to me now, but to uh, someone from Ming Dynasty China, it means something entirely different, because there it's the royal color and deserving of a certain type of respect that, you know, isn't part of my American culture. Um, so colors mean different things in different circumstances, which says that it is primarily an astral interaction with color. It affects us physiologically. It creates chemical changes in our bodies when we perceive different colors. Um, but mostly, it affects us psychologically at, a, at an emotional level. Um, so it, we vibrate in sympathy with color. You know, this is netzach, <clears throat> resonance with our environment. And when color is predominant, well, color in our environment is, you know, fundamental to our experience. Um, <clears throat> so, find out what colors mean to you. You can also look at the essential meaning of the color. If you're, you know, into working with essential meaning, look at the essential meaning of the red in that chair, you know. What does it communicate? Um, and then work with your imagination and color. You imagine yourself, you know, standing in this uh, blue universe and feel what it means. Feel the essential meaning <clears throat> of that uh, plane of blueness in the universe. Okay? That's where you really come to understand what the blue means beyond what our culture teaches us blue means, okay? That's really the primary way to learn what the different colors of light mean. <clears throat> and, you know, it's how we learn the vital energy and the elements, etc. We take it into our body first, you know, before we put it in any other body. <laughs> we have to feel it for ourselves and get to understand it that way, because it teaches us what we need to know. And it always teaches us what we need to know when we're open to it. You know, when we drop all our preconceptions and expectations. <clears throat> so, elementals, you know, it's very simple. You gather the light and, you know, fill it with your intention, give it a, a name, a lifespan, etc. I mean, Barden, you don't need me to retell what Barden has already explained very clearly. Um, <clears throat> Most of what he's talking about in the larvae are elementals that exist made out of or composed of the colored lights okay and that's why you know a personality generates so many larvae because that's a very astral you know understanding a very astral expression of light are these colored lights you know which means, ultimately, that they can be dissolved into light, pure light. Okay, it's a little, a little trick <clears throat> for dealing with larvae. Now, in step seven, the work with the elemental and the elementaries <clears throat> the beings composed of the four elements that have 
three bodies that have the, the breath uh, of life. That are true, you know, multidimensional beings, just like we are. Um, the very last step in that construction is an accumulation of light. Now, for an elementary, the light should always be white. And it should be, ideally, it should be the Catholic brilliance. But if not, it should be a white light. It should never be a colored light, really. <clears throat> Most <clears throat> elementaries constructed out of uh, colored lights um, are, are created for negative mean or negative desires, negative reasons. Um, because by necessity they contain the maker's astral ego, dealing with one of the colored lights in this creation process. Okay, so that that hand, as Barden says, uh, filled with the light, and it, uh, it must radiate like its own little sun, just be totally blinding with the light, and that's easy to do, just like you do with the the vital energy and with the elements. It's the same process. You, you treat the light, you know, as a magical substance that you can wield, okay? So gathering in your hands, hand is a very powerful thing to do psychologically. If you have your, for me, right hand, uh, you know, filled with the light, it is, you know, just psychologically a powerful thing to do, okay? So... You then, at the same time, this is the last thing you do, you breathe in life. It's hard to describe, but, I mean, you will feel it, you know. You breathe in life, and at the same time, the, the light that you have in your hand you know, follows your breath of life into the elementary. And this is what gives it life. This combination of the breath, the, the breathing, which is a very human thing of, I give you part of myself, of my life, and this imposition of the light, which is... <clears throat> The spirit, basically, um, representing the eternal spirit as opposed to the temporal spirit, which you've already established. You've already established a physical, astral, and mental body. So this is that, that life, the true life, going into your elementary. Okay? And it's the crowning gesture. Because... <clears throat> Light is crowning, you know, it's, it's completing something, uh, it's finishing it, it's really, it's animating and giving it life, okay? So in the elementaries, you're really only dealing with this white light, um, but you, it, it's, by this point of working with it, if you done your, the work with the elementals first, um, you become very comfortable and your uh, <clears throat> accumulation of the light is truly consequential. Let's put it that way. You know, it is truly potent. Um, yeah. So, um, <clears throat> in... PME, Practice of Magical Evocation, Barden's use of light is uh, planetary. So we're going with the planetary lights. Um, <clears throat> which are very straightforward. They're 
uh, planetary lives are lights are essentially alchemical ba alchem alchemy based. Um, they are the colors of the oxidation of the planetary metal. So we have red, which is the color of rust, which is the oxidation of iron. Um, <clears throat> copper, Venus, or iron Mars. Copper, Venus, copper is, uh, you know, not green, but Venus green is the oxidation, the very degree that forms on copper. Okay, black is the <clears throat> oxidation that forms on lead. Purple is the oxidation that forms on silver. Orange is the oxide of mercury, cinnabar. Okay, blue is the oxidation on tin. Now yellow for the sun is the color of gold, but there is no oxidation on gold. So it's the only planet that keeps its metallic color, its root metallic color. Okay, now in KTQ, the key to the true Kabbalah, all the colors for the letters are also based on these planetary colors. By way of astrology, the planetary colors, the planets rule the 12 zodiacal signs. And the planet that rules the sign is the root of the color of that sign. So in the key to the true Kabbalah, we're basically following the Hebrew de designations of the letter sounds to uh, either a planet or an astrological sign. Or a mother letter, uh, uh, an element, a pure element. So, the color, uh, well, you get my drift. You can work it out for yourself. It, it's very straightforward. Um, now those tie in, again, oddly enough, with the essential meanings of the colors. They, the essential meaning has been traced in these ways by our ancients, by our forebears, um, you know, in this really lovely system of planetary correspondences to astrological signs uh, to color and the uh, color's essential meaning. Now remember, <clears throat> color is astral, okay? So it's really more the significance of the colors than it is their essential meaning, but the significance is a direct outgrowth of essential meaning. It's how essential meaning affects us is what I would call significance, okay? So, I think that's all I can really say on the subject of light and color for now. I hope that uh, helped and uh, made some sense to y'all. Till next time, bye-bye.